Welcome back to Good Moms, Bad Choices. I'm Erica. And I'm Mila. Happy Wednesday, my love. Happy Wednesday, my love. How are you feeling? I'm good. I'm good. It's, you know. Um, I don't know what day this is going to find you, but the day that we recorded it, <laughs> it was wrapping up uh, Mercury grade. And we've been... Mercury grade? Mercury, Mercury, Mercury. Someone said, uh, my, someone said today, Mercury's someone said, in micro braids. No, someone said today, <laughs> my friend was like, because he thinks I'm ridiculous, because I was like, I'm not buying a phone. I'm not buying a phone because it's Mercury retrograde and it ends on Monday. And he was like, and I was like, I already know you're going to say, like, if you put power behind things and da 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 da, because it's the time I think he is. But today he was like, I think Mercury's like running out of Gatorade today, so I think you'll be good. <laughs> somebody, <laughs> somebody in the Slack community was like, because you know Mercury's in their micro braids. I was like, the fuck they are. <laughs> the real tight little tiny ones that the Africans did and pulled your edges out. <laughs> That's the kind of fucking Mercury micrograde room. Yep. Um, but, you know, it rained last night and I, I, I don't know. I felt like when I woke up, there was some energy trying to shift my energy because I'm such a fucking empath. Like my our friend called us with some stuff and it wasn't my stuff at all. But like I was feeling anxiety and I was like, release it, release it. Decided to release a bunch of shit. So I'm just releasing and pushing away all of the anything that's going to hinder my day. So I'm feeling good. You know, I woke up feeling good and then I looked out the window and I saw that it had rained and I I slept later than I usually do, which typically happens when it rains. And I was like, "You know what? I'm going to go. I was like, I'm going to work out this morning." But then I was thinking about Sylvia, um our astrologer and she was like one day she's like Yes, you know, today is my, um, I started my cycle, and so I won't be doing anything today. I won't be doing anything hectic today. And I was like, you know what? I'm not going to go work out. I'm going to go take my ass on a walk. And so I woke up this morning, and I went for a little walk around my block, walked to my coffee shop, came back. We were in the car for, like, about, like, 24 hours yesterday driving, and I realized, like, I had a migraine and I because we were encased inside of something. So this morning I went for a walk and I was like, I need to start doing this every morning. Just like going outside and taking a walk around my neighborhood because my neighborhood's pretty peaceful and quiet. And I don't love my I don't love my neighborhood. I like the inside of my house. Only. <laughs> my neighborhood's kind of the ghetto. <laughs> my neighborhood can be ghetto sometimes. Maybe I'll go to the park and do it. <laughs> Well, I'm not telling you to do it. I'm just telling you what I do. No, did. I agree with you. I feel like, out, you know, spending some time, some time outdoors and just, like, maybe even without your phone. Because I realized, like... I was going to do that, but then I was like, wait, I want music. So, yeah. I listened to Erica Badu album that I made you listen to four times yesterday. I listened to it again today. And I took a little stroll. It was great. That's nice. Um, anyway. <laughs> <laughs> That's how my Wednesday's going. <laughs> Beautiful. <laughs> It's a beautiful Wednesday. Um, I'm really excited. We have a g- special guest here. Um, we've, huh? Uh, are you gonna go ahead? Go ahead, you do it. <laughs> <laughs> I actually didn't. I didn't ask how you wanted to be introduced, but I'm going to just go off of. I'm gonna freestyle it. Absolutely, <laughs> I'm. I'm totally with that. Okay, we have Megan Doherty. Um, she is a certified life coach. Ah. Um, she is an expert on trauma. Trauma. And um, I would say, how to identify a narcissist? Yeah, narcissistic abuse. Yeah. Um, and I'm really excited that you're here. So welcome to the show. Thank you. So excited for this conversation. I'm so excited you're here because this has been a long time coming. Like we have been asked countless times to have someone on or for us to talk about narcissism. And I felt like I can't, I'm no expert. In <laughs> fact, I need help. <laughs> Um, so I was like, we need to find someone cause I got questions and yeah. I need answers. Um, and so I found you, thank mm-hmm. God. Thank you universe. <laughs> and, um, I'm just so grateful for you to come on the show and, you know, ed- educate us on this very important topic that I think men and women both mm-hmm. encounter. Um, and, uh, yeah, shed some light on, on this I guess what would you call this? A disorder. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I would call a it a disorder. Disorder. Disor- <laughs> really disorderly. This disorder. <laughs> it's so funny that we've been doing this for three and a half years, and literally we've discussed this personally four hundred million times. Like we need to talk about that. We need to bring somebody to talk about that. We need yeah. to talk about that. And then, and then, but it's taken time. But I'm just. I feel like it's the right time because I think we're ready to receive that information. I think we've both been victims of um, narcissistic abuse, and um, I'm really excited to learn more about it. Yeah. 
Uh, the more people I talk to, I realize so many people have gone through it. So the conversations need to be had. So I'm glad to be here. And I wonder what the percentage of people suffering from narcissistic disorder are. Like 90% of the world. <laughs> I hope not. Jesus. I'm That's scared. Deep. I'm going to hide in my house immediately. Well, yeah. <laughs> well, look around, yeah. baby. Look at the world, they bitch. They are everywhere. It's one out of 10 people. One out of 10 people. Oh, oh okay. Mm-hmm. Wow. Yeah. So it is about, what is that? <laughs> 10 percent i was wrong <laughs> fuck okay but. um but before we get into it do you want to pull a card I, d- I do um i lately i've been letting the guests pull the cards um which i like i'm, I'm feeling that <laughs> <laughs> um and today we pulled the uh temperance and I think this is pretty interesting because um, she is an angel and she's pouring from one cup to another. And the angel is both masculine and feminine. She wears a light blue robe with a triangle enclosed and a square on the front, representing that humans, the triangle, are bound by the earth and natural law square. The angel balances between one foot on the rocks, expressing the need to stay grounded, and one foot in the water, showing the need to be in flow. She pours water between two cups, symbolic of the flow and alchemy of life. Um, uh, in the background, there's a winding path up the mountain range, reflecting the journey through life. Above the mountains hovers a golden crown encased in a glowing light, a symbol of taking the higher path and staying true to one's life purpose and meaning. Wow. Um, anyway, this card is a card for bringing balance, patience, and moderation into your life. You're being invited to stabilize your energy and allow to the life force to flow through you without force or resistance. It's time to recover your flow and get your life back in order and balance. This card calls on you to remain calm even when life feels stressful or frantic. Maintain an even temperament and manage your emotions. You have learned to keep composed in stressful situations. Little things don't get to you thanks to your seemingly abundant source of patience. Your respect for balance and tranquility is what will help you achieve and experience a fulfilled life. Get that narcissist out your life, girl. Yeah. Find balance. <laughs> let Find that balance. Let it flow. Don't let that nigga <laughs> don't disturb let the nigga you. Sit. <laughs> You know what? Shout out again to Biddy Tarot. I really want to know if they know her. <coughs> I'm learning my tarot life all the way through Biddy every fucking week. <laughs> um, yeah, that was a good one. I do feel like it's time for you to let that narcissist go and flow and be in balance. That's where the fuck I'm at anyway. Mm. I am ready to let it go. <laughs> um, I feel like I told Erica before you got here that I'm a, um, a target. <laughs> How do you not be a target for narcissists? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, oh, also, do you have a, a, you had a really beautiful, um, affirmation. Yeah, it is. It's, it's safe to trust my intuition and the knowledge of my body. Safe Safe to trust my intuition and the knowledge knowledge of my my body. body. Mm. Some real shit. Cause your body be knowing. It be, does. Be your body be Listen. trying to tell you, like, girl, your stomach hurt for a reason. Right. Those it's downloads. Not butterflies. That's like your nervous system telling you to get the fuck out. Right? <laughs> Those clear <laughs> thoughts that say, like, run, bitch, you tripping. And yeah. you're like, no, no, don't. No, this bitch, you hurt. Chemistry. No, that's your nervous system. I'm intrigued. <laughs> <laughs> I should fight the feeling. Maybe it's he's, there's something more. Maybe he's a good person. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I really, I received that. That's a great one. I think that's one that I think most women, we are so intuitive, but we, go against ourselves yeah. all the time and we end up in situations that we 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 wouldn't have ended up in had we listened to our body and our intuition and um it's time to start doing that we're all yeah. witches in our own right you know and not the negative ones with the green the good kind yeah <laughs> we're all that witches feminine embodiment witch that's what we all it's all in us it is yeah. It is. It we is. Override our intuition, and that's how we end up like overlooking all the red flags. So, <laughs> so question: How did you kind of get into this work of you know, I guess, healing women and people from narcissists? Like, were you a victim of a narcissist? Yes, yes I was. I was in a horrible relationship. Um, lasted for about three years with a malignant narcissist, mm. and I came out of there with like CPTSD, a panic disorder. Like my whole life just fell apart. So. After I went through that, I realized that the the mental health field was kind of behind. They didn't know about narcissism, really, like how it affects people. And I started out writing a book, actually. I thought that's how I was going to, like, you know, 
raise awareness and then people just started flooding in like how do you know exactly what I went through how do you know exactly do you know my ex is it the same person you know <laughs> like I literally got messages like that and I'm like oh my god there's millions of women out there that have gone through the same exact thing and the narcissist stays the same the pathology is the same so yeah I just got all of my certifications and started helping women and men a smaller percentage but yeah Wait, what did you call the malignant narcissist? Malignant narcissist. What does that yeah. mean? So think Donald Trump, and yeah, in in real life, that's that's what we're we're dealing with there. Mm. So like a, like a high a high level. Yeah, it's like so a cancer. Well, I think malignant. <laughs> I think like I like like that grows. Well, yeah, just keeps growing and growing. And like really, yeah, just kind of like the kind that are like over and in your face and just tear people down and and don't care. Like that's that's what a malignant. Narcissist I is. think the mugs like those are scary, but the ones that are even more scary are the ones that are not malignant yeah, narcissists. The covert ones. Yeah, yeah, like those ones that appear to be like feminists or you oh, know. Yeah. Hoteps and lovers and Queen, yeah. yes, Queen. Um, I think I think the thing with those is that they first start out super kind, super approachable, super like, oh, it seems one way, and what they do is they like present a certain way, yeah, and then somewhere down the line, it's this completely other thing, and so it's almost like it's confusing your. It's confusing your intuition yeah. <laughs> because you've gotten to know one thing and then you're attached to that one thing and then they pull out some other shit yeah. from somewhere behind them that you didn't expect and see coming and th so you're waiting for the other part to come back mm -hmm. and so then that's where it gets confusing. That's the whole cycle right there. Uh. <laughs> <laughs> that, that is it. I told you I'm a target girl. I told you I'm a survivor. You, you've been through this <laughs> I'm before. I'm a survivor. <laughs> Q, I'm a survivor. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to stop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it is and even the malignant ones start off like that it's like it's literally love fraud like they come in with love bombing <gasps> you know get you all like tied into future future faking and most of them do that so they don't start off with just being you know being like a loud asshole that's going to tear you down they they pull you in and get you addicted to like the intimacy and the all of that it's yeah it's love fraud oh that's God. where the term love bombing <laughs> comes from yeah so what are like I think like what would help is like maybe like what is like a few different signs of a narcissist like what is number one whether you are a malignant narcissist or a covert I don't know if there's like two different lists that happen or mm -hmm. if they're like if there's like one standard list of how you identify a narcissist yeah so there's two major categories so there's overt and covert and that just really has to do with how they abuse and how they manipulate when you're in the relationship or work relationship churches do it all that so it's not just like one person um but yeah once you get into like a relationship with them what they do is they pull you in with the love bombing right so superficial charm you know, telling you what you want to hear, all of these things. And so the love bombing, I feel like that's one of the most important parts of narcissistic abuse. Because they got to get you, like, wrapped into the story. And um, they're going to be saying things about you, like how much they love you. And they don't even know you. So that's one of the biggest red flags, right? Mm. Love bombing feels disingenuous if you're following your intuition. Now, if you have, like, a lot of us I know, like, have, like, uh, like childhood trauma and all of that and you have wounding and you feel like okay I need this like this feels so good it's intense but it feels good and you override the fact that it's not genuine that's one of the first red flags that you miss mm. when it comes to narcissists and then other than that like after you're wrapped in with them it's like they do everything I call it like death by a thousand cuts so they start Oof. to tear you down yeah death oh, by a slowly yeah oh my god yeah. that's true <laughs> I feel like I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah yeah they start to slowly like tear you down so there's a the cycle is idolize devalue discard and they may hoover you back in and start the cycle all over again Wait, idolize idolize yep devalue, devalue discard, discard and then hoover you back, back in. in if you let them and start the cycle all over so the cycle continues throughout the relationships so the devalue phase is where it all switched up like you, you're talking about like you're like where is this person that came in like with all the love and the promises and stuff and then it's like criticism different types of abuse um psychological abuse like really fucking with your head and yeah that's how it Oh, it's like, do you love me or do you hate me? Both. I'm so confused. Yeah. 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 I've experienced <laughs> that. Like, I know he told me he loved me, but this, now he's saying like something different. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> do you like me or not? <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. That confusion. Confusion is one of the biggest red flags, too. Like, if you are confused, like, this person 
that they loved me. Like they, they pulled me in in this very like intense way. And now I feel like they, they secretly hate me. Like that's one of the biggest red flags of a narcissist also. Mm, secretly hate me. Yeah, I felt that way too. I mean, I think like, you know, what I will say, I was telling Jamila before you came, I was like, you know, I feel like there's certain words or hot words that are like popular right now and like mm-hmm. not popular, but I think we finally have the language to put behind certain things. Yeah. For example, anxiety. Like I didn't have that like anxiety wasn't even a word in my vocabulary maybe until like I don't know like six or seven years ago like I would just be like I'm overwhelmed I'm stressed out or like I don't know why I'm crying I don't know why I feel overwhelmed like I didn't have that vocabulary and and the same with narcissism like I feel like that's a word too that gets thrown around a lot I think I think specifically with women we we throw that around a lot and we call men narcissists and sometimes they are and I feel like sometimes they aren't right yeah so how do you kind of like how do you know like the difference between someone who maybe is just Mm -hmm. has some shit Mm -hmm. some traumas they got or they they want to work through and is a narcissist because there's probably people listening right now like are like is my man a narcissist or is or should I stick by him and like maybe we just can work through this Mm -hmm. so that's (laughs) such a good question and I get that a lot so there when it comes to an actual narcissist if they have narcissistic personality disorder or a character disorder There's a lot of research happening. It changes like day by day. Um, You're going to have three major things, and we call them the three E's. So that's a lack of empathy, right, impaired empathy, exploitation, and entitlement, okay? So severe lack of empathy, right? Like they can't even put themselves in your your shoes for, for a moment. So that's why they can basically try to destroy you and not care. So the difference between an actual narcissist and just an asshole, right? Because I've had people coming to me, I've literally had like clients that'll like sign up to work with me and like through through a discovery call, I'm like, you weren't dealing with the narcissist. Like this was just like a regular, like run of the mill asshole. Like, like, you know, should you be so lucky that he wasn't actually a narcissist? Um, But yeah, somebody that's like just generally an asshole or they have some like unhealed childhood trauma. So they're like in their kind of self-protective mode, because I think that's a lot of what we're dealing with. A lot of what women deal with when it's not a narcissist, that person could hurt you, but they're actually going to feel empathy from, for hurting you and try to apologize, try to make things right. A narcissist is going to hurt you and then say, you deserved it. You made me do it and, or make you feel like that and gaslight you out of the fact that they ever hurt you to begin with. So that's one of the biggest differences, right? Do you think narcissists, though, too, because I'm thinking of someone specific, that he apologizes, but then does, doesn't doesn't really no, mean nothing it. ever do- changes? A hundred percent. Okay, because I was like, the nigga be apologizing. Yeah. <laughs> they don't want to lose you, but they do. They want to keep you to, like, 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 a, like, to play with you as their food yeah, or something. Narcissistic like. supply. So that's what we call it, narcissistic supply. Like, you are a, a source of supply for them. Attention, validation, sex money, ego strokes, all of that. So basically narcissists use people as just utility. They don't actually form a connection with you. So yeah, they'll apologize because they're not done using you. Are narcissists sociopaths? Yes, it's the same thing. So it is the same thing. Yes, absolutely. So (laughs) yeah, so my ex was was diagnosed narcissistic sociopath, like with the the hyphen in the middle. (laughs) The thing about narcissism, and this is important to say, is that it exists on a spectrum, okay? So there are people that are like, in the actual spectrum is from zero to 10. So you can be on the spectrum, but not be actively abusing people. So the ones that are higher on the spectrums are the ones that are, the actual sociopaths and you'll the the cycle of abuse is so like apparent when it's them so (sighs) i'm i like i'm i'm pretty clear that my person the person i'm thinking of is level 100 narcissist (laughs) um mainly because i mean i i've said this so many times like even to jamila like i'm like every time i talk to this fucking person he cannot stop talking about himself it doesn't matter like what it is I didn't ask you for this fucking information all I asked you was hey can you do this or not and he's like well you know I'm so sorry but you know Nas called and blah 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 blah, blah, and I'm doing this I'm like nigga no one asked you (laughs) nothing about that um and I've called him a narcissist many times and I I I think it's very rare that a narcissist will actually acknowledge that he's a narcissist Mm -hmm. Is there a cure for narcissism? Because like I was, we were like I was talking to her, and I was like, I feel like kids are like 
like baby narcissists. Yeah. Yeah. Like are we all born narcissists and then you have to learn your way out of it? Like how do you like can you undo your narcissism? There's this guy on the internet who is a self proclaimed narcissist in 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 recovery or whatever. And I'm very curious, like, is it healthy for a narcissist to be on social media talking about his narcissism? And I really question that. I was like, how can you recover if you're getting constantly getting validated right. for your narcissisms? Like, mm-hmm. so I'm just wondering. He's being validated for his his uh, his pointing out of his. Narcissism. I just feel like it's this very slippery yeah. slope that's very hard to like kind of separate the the lines of like of that, you know, mm-hmm. because you're you're getting validated. You're getting attention. You're getting attention for saying you're not, but you're mm-hmm. also getting attention, which is feeding your narcissism. Absolutely. So, like, how does one? But, but then, like, naturally, humans enjoy attention. You know, like, it's like, do not I like all it? of them? Not every human. No, not every. But like, positive attention. I think people like. I mean, not like the spotlight has to be on you, but I think so, most humans enjoy attention from people. Yeah, but most pe- humans are not going to go on the internet and create reels every single day if they, <laughs> yeah. you know, like. Yeah. Okay. You're right. <laughs> if they're, I'm not saying you're a narcissist. You create reels every day, like. <laughs> but I just mean like. Yeah. If you are a self-proclaimed diagnosed narcissist mm-hmm. and your life, you live on social media to talk about yourself, is that actually like constructive to healing your narcissism? I'm just, I just don't know how that works. How does, so basically what I think what my question was is can a narcissist actually recover from narcissism yeah so the psychology books say absolutely not it's a fixed character disorder that's what i've heard Whoa, is, is that what fixed, it says yeah it's it's a fixed character I've heard disorder there's there is no amount of healing now what they can do is they can't and, and, and let me just tell you this is like point zero 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 one percent of narcissists would ever do this because they don't have the ability to introspect that's another like cornerstone of narcissism abuse so if you don't think that you're doing anything wrong because you feel entitled because you have this whole like world made up in your head where you gaslight people out of their own realities who's going to go into therapy you know there's there's a therapy called cold therapy that can help with like they just have a really fixed like self-protective program and this actually helps for people that just went through really traumatic childhoods but most narcissists will not do that and then even if they do like a lot of therapists don't even work with them because there's no there, there there's is no, no fix it because yeah. I heard you mention that your ex was a diagnosed mm-hmm. what wh- how did he get diagnosed what like pushed him to go get the diagnosis and like and then and, uh, on, on top of that tell you <laughs> be yeah, honest so, about it you know because so. niggas will get it and be like that's not true <laughs> so he didn't actually tell me the story it's, it's a wild story but after years of dating I found out that he had kids that I didn't know about oh and, shit. And yeah <laughs> yeah and that he had been married before and so, like, after, like, going through, like, some of his devices when he was <laughs> traveling to where it was supposed to be work, which actually happened to be a place where he had a whole other house and another woman there. It was, yeah, wild. Um, I found emails between not him and his ex-wife, but it was, like, court documented. Like, they had to be, like, people had to, like, a judge had to look at them or a lawyer had to look at them. Like, they can't communicate unless somebody is, like, supervising the, the communication. So within that, I read the emails and she was saying, you know, because of you, like you're a narcissist and this and this, and you're supposed to present this when you go to pick him up from school and all of this. And it was like proof that he was diagnosed as, you know, a narcissist, narcissist. sociopath. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. What did he say when you said, hey, motherfucker? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what about that other woman and that marriage and those oh, children? He, and He gaslit me. First, well, first of all, this is what most narcissists do. How dare you snoop? How dare shit, you're, right? you're snooping. I can't deal with somebody that's like crazy enough to like look through my devices. So I spent like three days apologizing. You know, that's the psycho. Um, but yeah, he never admitted it, of course. Like he said, like eventually that he had some issues with women in the past and he knew something was wrong with them, but he didn't know exactly what it was and all of this stuff. So yeah, but there, there is no, there is no cure. There is no like, yeah. So if you're with one and you feel like, okay, we can go to therapy, couples counseling therapy is the worst possible thing to do with a narcissist because they will use that to gaslight you even more and they'll groom the therapist. And a lot of times it ends up backfiring. So yeah. If the therapist can't identify that you're a narcissist, they what kind of therapist are you going right. to? Money? They fall prey to narcissists because they're so good with words, right? Mm. They're really good with words. And a lot of them are actually really smart, smart and very intelligent. So they can, like, talk their way in and out of stuff. And they will groom the therapist to think, 
like you're the crazy one it's your fault and all of that so is it weird that I feel like I just I had this vision of like all the one out of ten narcissists like in a like are we just supposed to like throw them off a cliff like where do they <laughs> like they're, they're no use for society get out of here <laughs> you can't be fixed you're right I mean what do we do with them where yeah. are they gonna go they need to go to a home as far away from me as possible <laughs> They could, like maybe they should just get together, right? Like two narcissists yeah. together. Oh yeah, that what about that? Happens. Is that like that is that like true love? That? Like oh my god, what if there's a TV show no, for like there is. narcissists there who is, find love? There is a sh- oh my god, I, don't, I can't believe how I forgot this. I don't know why the fuck I don't watch TV, but at Danielle's house I do, and <laughs> this bitch loves Netflix. And there's a fucking show. Oh my god, what is it called? Oh my god, it, it's the second season, and he used to be a murderer, but now he it's John or something or what? it's not, oh John. No, it's not John. Oh. Fuck, he used to be a murderer. <laughs> Oh my god! Yeah, but now this this season he got a murderer you? wife. You, that's you. a thing. Oh, okay. you. Now he has you. Yes, that's a perfect example of two narcissists together. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. He has. Oh, I haven't watched this. I haven't watched. So it. now he got a he got a narcissist wife who also murders, and now they so they look like yeah. perfect together. And then I have a baby. Yeah. So it's still okay about the babies. Oh God. Oh god, but it's kind of like Dexter. Yeah, it's kind of like Dexter. Because the, but then they, it always ends up going bad because there's always like one worse narcissist than the other, and the other narcissist oh, yeah. has to like fix scale it, scale them back. Like, yeah. bitch, you're going crazy. Like, we didn't. That's I know. exactly what's happening on the show. Oh yeah, god, that's <laughs> what happens. Yeah, they they can end up together, and they just I call it like slow dancing in a burning room for the rest of their lives with like <laughs> knives in each other's back. And I've it's seen it play out in cuts, real life. Thousands of cuts. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it definitely can happen. Yeah. So if we have some questions we yeah. from some of our um, our listeners, and one of them was, how do you co-parent with a narcissist? Mm-hmm. Like, yeah. what do you do? Because you have a kid with one, can't get rid of them mm-hmm. you publicly. Yeah. <laughs> publicly. But <laughs> oh. you have to stay away from them as much as possible. The very <laughs> minimal, very minimal communication <laughs> as much, yeah. strictly through text message. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's, that's <laughs> exactly at- it. So... Yeah, so low to no emotional contact. Um, literally only speak to them when it had to do with the child. There's um, a website that I give to all my clients. It's called Our Family Wizard. Mm. So if you download that, you can actually like do all communication through there. Dates when you have to pick them up through there. This can be supervi- supervised by the courts. Um, any money that's used can be put in there. Um, so you keep what you have to do is keep it like keep as much control of the situation as possible, because if you don't then they're going to start pulling you back into the cycle of abuse, like with anxiety and making things, you know, they use their kids as pawns most of the time. So, yeah. How do you protect your child in that situation? Like, for instance, someone who obviously refuses to go get, you know, um, like get exam, get what is it called? examined diagnosed, diagnosed, yeah, diagnosed yeah. and 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 you have to like share a child with that person like how do you protect your child right absolutely i think document as much as you possibly can um make sure that you work with like judges and lawyers and these people that actually understand psychological abuse and narcissistic abuse there are some they're, they're very few and far between but there are some that have been through it and understand it make sure the people around you that are helping you with like custody get that he's disordered or she's disordered right because it's not just men um and yeah and just make sure you pay attention to your kids one of the biggest things is that they will start to gaslight your children and you triangulate your children against you so you want to make sure that you're the stable person that you're mirroring their emotions that you're encouraging them to speak their truth and trust their intuition even at a like a small age and um yeah that's the that's the best you can do as far as protecting him but just them but just like pay attention to you know if their mood changes when they come from you know the house and all of that and document everything i i was going to say i mean i think that it's 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 so it, that's very disheartening mm-hmm. i mean because there really is no big answer you know mm-hmm. like i think people parents look for these answers like what do you do and it's like well you chose to have a child with this person and now this is the aftermath of that and there really is no fix of or real protection that you can really offer besides what you said is like arming your kids with their intuition I think there's like always like an a reparenting that has to happen when you send your kid off with your narcissistic co-parent and then they come back and you have to do this reparenting Mm -hmm. the only other thing to do is really limit the the exposure they have to that parent and that's really hard because like how feel do you guilty with that well too. you feel guilty and also 
unless this person is diagnosed, and I don't even know if the, even if they are diagnosed, if any sort of judge is going to say that's enough for you not to be able to be around your child. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, they absolutely the the judges and 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 lawyers that understand it can make it so like the the children's their safety is number one, right? So most of the time in these situations, most of these narcissists are very abusive, right? So you have like the record of like domestic violence and all of that that's there. So as long as like they know, the court system knows about that, they will, hopefully, they will do the best they can to help you protect your child. I've heard some fucking horror stories, you guys. Like I have a friend of a friend who recently, um, my friend was dating a woman for like the last three years and she was had a baby with a narcissist and a lot of he probably has a lot of other disorders. But um, when the baby daddy found out she had a new man, he was so angry and infuriated and wanted to hurt her so bad. The little girl started coming home telling her that her dad was touching her in the bathtub. Mm-hmm. So obviously her first you know things go to the courts. Um the courts were not protective. Um, they continued to allow this person to have visit partial visitation. The little girl was like, I want to say three or four at the time, and they would interview her. She would get scared. At one point, she hadn't seen him for some time when she initially told the courts. Eventually, she had to start reintroducing her to him. They weren't protective, and to the point where she was like, but we're going to go, they're gonna, you're going to see your dad today. The little girl peed on her pants, mm-hmm. was having a fucking anxiety attack, um, I want, so she continued to fight this. The father continued to fight for this custody, and it looked like the courts were about to grant him back uh, visitation permanently without being supervised. So um, she got she had a lawyer. The lawyer told her, the only reason I'm still in this business is to warn women. Mm-hmm. She said, a lot of women think with all the evidence they have with their children testifying that they will get full custody and most of the time that does not happen Mm -hmm. in fact a lot of the times uh the the father can end up getting more custody than begin with and she's like i only stayed in this business to tell women to get the fuck out Mm -hmm. that person had to take her kids and disappear Mm -hmm. before the last final court date and it was so much so like the the lawyer was so in on it that she met with my friend who was her boyfriend at the time like in secrecy in incognito like literally like in baseball cap like told him like lay low for three months and you know I'm happy she got out yeah yeah. she's like I've seen so many cases where women just think there's overwhelming evidence against the man and 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 the court does not honor that and um, I think, you know, we as we don't think about that, we're women, we think that they're going to protect you and they don't. And I think also, like, I don't know that that person or or that baby daddy, but sometimes people want to hurt you so bad. You have no idea how and what ways they'll do it. Um, I'm I was in a super like like emotionally abusive relationship, verbally abusive, because he is a, he was, he is a narcissist and it took me a long time getting to get out of it and to acknowledge that it was abuse. Like Mm -hmm. to say that out loud seemed like, wow, that seems extreme Jamila, like relax. But it was like coming out of it and like dating other people and seeing how I was like within relationships with other people. And like it, it, it took some time to, a lot of time and I'm still unraveling from that to the point where like the nigga would say something like say we're all here be like stupid bitch and then we'd be like I'd be like why the fuck did you just call me a bitch he's like I didn't call you a bitch Mm -hmm. and we'd be like we just all heard you call her a bitch like my friends would be like yes you did and he'd be like no I didn't it was like to the point where like this is what I'm dealing with like no wonder I'm crazy (laughs) no wonder (laughs) bitch has gone crazy you're crazy nigga um so it's just like I think a lot of women especially black women, you know, I think we're so strong and shit and we're like, everything's Gucci and you like, and as women in general, we just like love so much and we nurture and we want to fix people. But like, I think that we totally downplay how that affects us, how emotionally and like how coming out of that and rebuilding yourself after that is such a process and requires so much work. Like, you know, that was a relationship from like 
five years ago now. And I probably lingered in that relationship for a long time, sexually or whatever, just like a little pinky toe in, a foot in. And it just, and this is a person I've known my most of my life. So it took a long time to recognize those, those habits and like see how it's affected me. And then and even after that, carrying that shit into my next relationship, my next relationship, accepting shit that was totally unacceptable because I'm kind of like used to that kind of behavior. And like coming back to the what you were saying about the the child, you know, my child, we had a situation. Her dad said something to her that was completely inappropriate about me. And literally like, almost a year later, she said it. She was like, I remember when daddy said da, 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 da. And I was like, oh, my God, like this, what the fuck memory do you have? And I said, mm-hmm. call him and tell him how you feel. And she called him and I can hear him saying, I didn't say that. And she was like, yes, you did. Yes, you did. And Erica was like, she, Erica had to tell me, she's like, you really need to talk to her because I'm proud of her that she was able to tell him and check him because people will try and confuse you all the time. And she was like, no, you didn't. Yes, you did. I remember. And I had to call him and say, look, people are going to men. I'm trying to confuse her, trying to downplay her thoughts, her feelings. Do not do that. I said, just fucking apologize. And of course, like reluctantly he did. But like, I realized like I can't, I'm not ever going to remove her, you know, but it is important that I explain to her how important it is that instinctually you follow your own gut. Like I was telling her that in the shower. I was, she was like, "Uh, daddy said I came from him. I said, you saw the video, right? (laughs) <laughs> she was like, yeah. I was like, she's like, why does he do that? I was like, I don't know, but you got to listen to your gut. She was like, what does that mean? I'm like, whatever you know is right in your heart and in your body. And I was like, with anybody, you know, like, because we all know as teenage girls, as you get older, as you start to like guys, that niggas will try and confuse you. Mm-hmm. Even teachers. I remember teachers saying slick shit to me and not, not having the confidence to be like, nah, nigga. You know what I mean? So, like, as parents, as moms, like, it's so important that we instill that type of shit in our kids because you're going to come across all types of disorders in this motherfucker and you got to be able to combat that and recognize it, you know? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, I feel, yeah, when I was sitting there and Luna... I, I love your daughter so much. You're, she, don't, she don't play. <laughs> she was like, mm-mm, nope, you said it. Right, yeah. And she was relentless. And, I, and like, that's something that, yeah, you, that we have to fight to keep in our, in our children and mm. empower them because it is inevitable. It's inevitable. And I was, I, like, I was looking up these facts because I was like, what, what person, like, are men more narcissistic than women? Mm-hmm. And I mean, there's definitely some crazy bitches out there for sure. Yeah, yeah but it weighs heavier on men. There's more. Yeah. Apparently, there's more. I think what was the statistic? It says seven point seven percent of men are narcissistic versus four point eight. Mm-hmm. And I'm just wondering if that has anything to do with just like testosterone or like e- like I don't know, male ego yeah, being like, well, stronger than the female ego in some way. I don't. I mean, I don't know even know if that's it, true. It, but is a narcissism? I think you said no. I think you're just born with it. Is narcissism a result of some type of trauma, like specific right. type of trauma? So that's exactly what, what I was gonna say. So it's important to note that. So there's different ways that narcissists are made, right? Um, and some of them are born. Some of it is genetics, like a sociopath has a child, and it's it was a mixture of nature and nurture. But you know, some of them are born. Um, when you get into psychopathy, that's they're born that way, right? It doesn't matter how they were raised, that they're, they're going to be a psychopath, okay? Um, and that's a no conscious disorder. So narcissism and sociopathy, when it's blended, is a low conscious disorder. Mm. So it can be like it can develop in multiple ways. So there are some that are born out of trauma. Okay, they had a horrible childhood. They weren't. They were either abused, abandoned. Um, their emotions weren't mirrored back to them. Like early childhood development was just all fucked up. Okay. So yeah, then they have like, it's a self-protective mechanism and they just allow that to solidify and they just go through life like that because that's how they get their needs met. Okay. So yeah, so it can, it can happen because of trauma, but that's not, that's not it. All right. And it's important to say that too, because a lot of people are like, well, they're a narcissist. They must've had a horrible childhood. I should have more empathy for them. And if they, if their horrible childhood, like made them this way, then maybe I can love them into being a better person. And no, there's like, once it's fixed, it's fixed. It's there. Okay. Another way that narcissists can be made is by being spoiled by having a permissive parent. Mm. So you can have everything that you want and just they let you just do whatever you want. And then that's how the narcissism can be formed in that way. 
Mm. So yeah, it's, you it's, hear that, parents? <laughs> Discipline your motherfucking kids. Right? <laughs> they need to be disciplined. Yeah, and then too, like the reason why there was more males than there are females is because, and there are a lot of female narcissists. Like, don't get me wrong. Like, I have clients, and a, a large after having a male narcissistic mate, the second biggest one is having a narcissistic mom. Okay, mm. so there's a lot of, but it shows up differently. A lot of times, it's actually diagnosed as borderline personality disorder. Um, Why is that? A, is that like for women? It's usually diagnosed women, that way. It is, and the thing with borderline personality disorder is what we're learning is that that has more to do with trauma than being a fixed character disorder. So the it's there's a lot of like I said, mis and mixed information out there. Um, but with men, like they store everything in their bodies, right? And they're taught like, okay, you can't cry, you can't process these emotions. And one of the biggest ways to carry trauma with you is to have repressed emotions, mm -hmm. okay? It gets stored in your body, like literally at a cellular level. So if you think about the, the male archetype that they're like, okay, you don't cry, don't, you know, don't talk about your emotions, all of this. That's why a lot of them get fixed in that character disorder because they never had an outlet for their trauma. Mm -hmm. Now, there's a big difference, too, in somebody that had a really traumatic childhood, and they can actually go to therapy or go to coaching and really learn how to process all of that stuff that's in their body, and then they can heal from that. But narcissists can't. It's just fixed that way. So that's why more males are than females because we're encouraged to be expressive and all of that. And, I mean, us as black women, we don't get as, you know, the – afforded the opportunity to really express ourselves as much as we would like right so we're holding space for each other um but yeah that's uh that's why it's different between male and, and female can you have narcissistic traits mm -hmm. and not be a narcissist yes so narcissistic traits again it, it, it narcissism exists on a spectrum so somebody that has narcissistic traits will be low like from like zero to three um, and yeah, it, it's definitely more of traits than an actual character disorder. But when we talk about like that identifiable cycle of narcissistic abuse, like pulling you in, then abusing you and then like discarding you and then pulling you back in and the gaslighting and all of that, those are usually people that are higher up on the, on the spectrum. So somebody can be really low on the spectrum, but they're not an actual narcissist because they just have narcissistic traits and they could possibly go to therapy to heal from that. But if you're like sitting here like, if you're listening to this and you think you're with a narcissist because you've been abused and you feel confused and you have, like, brain fog and all of that, you're dealing with an actual narcissist, and, and that's not going to change. So, Do you have people who come to you as a client and say, I think I'm a narcissist? Um, yeah, I get a lot of that. Like, via my page, I get a lot of that. I don't answer them because, like, go find a therapist. Like, I'm <laughs> not a therapist. You know what I mean? Like, I'm an actual, I'm a coach. So, um, and I have no desire to help people that are narcissistic. I just stay away from me. I'm helping survivors and that's it, right? Um, but yeah, I do get that a lot. And then I also, there's another thing, and this is important to note also, is that there are people who were raised by narcissists. So like I said, I have a lot of clients that had a narcissistic mom or a narcissistic dad. And what happens is that your self-protective programming is fighting fire with fire. So you picked up the traits of your parent, but you're not actually a narcissist. But that's, how, that's the only way you could survive. Okay, so a lot of people, I have had some clients that are just like, I feel like I've picked up some of their traits. And that's, yeah, that's very valid. But you can heal and unlearn that once you're, once you're safe. So. Oh, because you don't feel safe, you then react in a way that may gaslight or that may, yeah. because you, that's the only way you've learned to protect yourself. Yeah, that was the only way you could survive in a household with other narcissists. So, yeah. Mm. So what do you think, like, what are the beginning stages of, like, healing from a narcissist like what is like the first step besides leaving yeah so yeah number one is harm reduction like get out get out get out all right so you're safe um and then number two is partner with somebody like a lot of narcissists like to isolate you from your friends your family all of that so you have no support systems so that's the first thing I said no matter whatever form that comes in close friends coach therapist somebody that gets it like have a support system um, and then after that, literally like focusing on like your nervous system, like all unlearning all of the things because your brain actually changes when you're in these relationships. Like you have like your brain, the brain fog, like the, the chemical, biochemical, like part of your brain changes. How? So you have to, yeah, it's just um, a mixture between like the stress hormones that are constantly running through your body. So like for me, I had adrenal fatigue, meaning my adrenals were like, Fuck it. We're not doing anything else. I was having like three panic attacks per day. There was a time where I was so brain fogged. I couldn't read. I had to like go on leave from my job. Like your brain changes because what happens is that it's like it, all the energy is being used to protect you. 
And then with the, you know, stress hormones constantly running through your nervous system, you're in constant fight or flight. Okay, so it's really a matter like healing from narcissistic abuse is more of a physical healing process than it is anything else. It's a process of like sending messages from your body to your brain that you're finally safe Mm. and continue in that self-care. So the brain fog goes away and and all of that. Like reassuring yourself that you're safe now. That's not where you're at in, in that you can like react in a different way. A hundred percent. Yeah. Cause if not, the triggers will keep going that, you know, the nightmares, how you show up in other relationships, it'll affect all of that. So in that, like I do a bottom up approach. So it's literally focusing on the body, like literally somatically like breath work, um, meditation, movement, um, massage, all of that. It sends messages to your nervous system that you're safe. So that's the biggest thing. And I like to say that too, because a lot of people are like, okay, I'm out of the relationship. I'm safe now, and they don't want to. They wonder why their symptoms keep, you know, keep going, and why they still have like problems, like in relationships with other people and that kind of thing. So, yeah. I, I think for me, like I realized that I think, I think that in my relationship, um, the nar- the narcissist that I was in a relationship with, uh, his narcissism. I mean, he was like maybe like a little baby narcissist at first, mm-hmm. but then it just <laughs> like baby it was. It was like baby. It was like oh, he's so egotistical, but like you know, he's confident. He's so confident. Mm-hmm. <laughs> uh, he's so fun. We have so much fun together. Um, and now it's it's grown and grown and grown, and now it's very apparent. It's so apparent. So then leaving that relationship and then dating. I found I found that I was still attracting a nar- narcissist. Um, they weren't showing up like him. They were showing up in different ways, and it's like it took me a while. I was like, "Wow, it's like it's like a narcissist in like sheep's clothing." I'm like, "How the fuck did how the fuck did I get here again?" Like, you're not like him, but like you are. It's like ha- they sh- them showing up in different ways can be really confusing for women. And I think like. For me, I know I had to ask myself, I was like, am I a narcissist? Like, am, am I a narcissist? Is that why I keep attracting narcissists? And then someone was like, no, a narcissist does, don't attract narcissists. Is that true? Yeah, that that is very true. So the, the large majority of people that, and I hate that, like, for the lack of a better term, like, you don't attract narcissists. So this is what I like to say, right? I just had this conversation a couple of days ago. We're beautiful women. We attract everything. It's who we allow to stay, Mm. all right? So, and a lot of times the person that we allow to stay reminds us of something that happened in the past. Mm. It's what your nervous system deems familiar because, unfortunately, that primitive part of your brain and your body thinks familiar equals safe, even if it doesn't. Mm. So, subconsciously, you're attracted to this person that feels like, that abusive relationship or that feels like the abusive parents. That's why a lot of people are like, I grew up in an abusive household. And then I literally, I, the narcissist in my life was a living, breathing, like new version of my dad, you know, like a trauma bond. Yeah, absolutely. Trauma bond. Yeah. That's what, that's the, that's the glue of the trauma bond. Right. So yeah, you, you don't attract narcissists. It's just like you attract everybody and then you, you feel they're familiar. So you're, that's the one you're, that's the one you're attracted to. Yeah, absolutely. And, and the the process of unlearning that is just a process of like healing the core wounds that you have. Like you have core wounds of rejection, abandonment, that kind of thing that connected you to that first narcissist and have you healed those wounds. Cause I say like a healed person or healed woman that's like embodied in her feminine will not like, yeah, you can't. Yeah, you're, you're not going to be around a narcissist. You're not going pen- to be... They're not going to penetrate you. Yeah, yeah, yeah they, they'll come towards you, but then you'll see the red flags, you'll trust your intuition, you'll walk away at the first, you know, couple red flags, so... I, do you... So I'm attracted to alpha males. Mm-hmm. Um, <laughs> I find, though, that a lot of alpha males have narcissistic tendencies. Mm-hmm. Is this, like, an overall theme of alpha males, or am I just not the alpha males that I'm attracted to aren't genuinely alpha males. Yes. So Mm. it can be, so I I know exactly what you're talking about too. I'm like alpha male, like they have to be like a certain height, big, I have to feel small around them, like (laughs) all of that, like, but in a physical way, in a good way, right? In a healthy way. Um, So yeah, there are some men that masquerade as alpha males that it's a lot, it's really them being insecure and that's how they overcompensate in that way. Okay. So a healthy masculine and a healthy alpha male is going to be like grounded in their body and their truth and really have a safe space for the feminine. 
You know what I mm-hmm. mean? So they can still be like, you know, like they'll handle things if it needs to be handled. They'll make you feel like, you know, small and like in a, in a good way again, like protected and all of that. But if they're if they have like traits that are like, OK, well, they are not like their mind body is just com- connected, like they don't have empathy and they don't have time for like anything that's like not surface level. then that's not really a true alpha male. It's just somebody that's like more insecure and that's how they overcompensate in that way. But like I have like my fiance, alpha male, ex rugby player, six, four, big guy, tough. But he's grounded in his, like, body and in his emotions. He's done his work to heal his trauma. So he's an alpha male, but a very healthy, safe alpha male for me. Mm. So. Not, like, projecting his trauma onto you. 100%. And, he, and, and there was a time where he was back in the past, not to me, but just in general, because mm. he hadn't healed. But And the thing with most actual narcissists is, that, again, they can't introspect to the level where they're never going to do that inner work that really needs to happen. Um, so, yeah. so deep um yeah i mean i think i think that like i just in in my dating it is i think being a survivor of a narcissist and me not even realizing that he was a narcissist i really think until far after we broke up it like wasn't like I was uh, navigating in this relationship and I didn't end it because well it sort of did because of his narcissism but like that wasn't why you know and then like Mm -hmm. afterwards really understanding oh shit like I've been in a relationship with a narcissist for a good part of my life Mm -hmm. um not understanding how how the trauma has shown up for me and how even now like I question my I like I I sometimes I'm nervous about the people that I choose like I get nervous when I like someone because I'm like is is that is that is that a narcissistic trait like I've so much so that I've told my friends I was like hey so the next person that I date I need you to meet him immediately <laughs> <laughs> I actually did this recently I like literally threw this guy into like the fire of like meeting all my friends at at once. (laughs) Yeah. Um, Poor guy. Um, (laughs) And like, cause I feel like sometimes like my narcissist radar is, is off. I don't really, I don't really know how, well now I think I have a better understanding of how to identify them. But I think a lot of times they can be really, it can be really hard because it doesn't show up immediately. And then you become attached to this person and then you start making excuses for this person. And, and then it's years later and you're still with this person and then you have to recover from that. Like, do you think that people actually like can fully recover from like a malignant narcissist? 100%. I did. Yeah. Yeah, I did. And I have, hundreds of clients how long do you think it how long does it take how long were you in therapy (laughs) (laughs) well how long long was the relationship versus how long you had to be in therapy after the relationship yeah (laughs) well so like to that point I talk a lot about this unfortunately like the mental health like field is not like you will actually got re-traumatized in therapy I went from therapist to therapist and they had no clue what was going on like and so I was trying to tell them you know this is why these physical symptoms are showing up and they're like well we haven't diagnosed him as a narcissist so we're not going to talk about any of that so I, oh, we don't know him we only have to talk about yeah, you yeah okay. so what and so just bringing up like being in therapy I want to say like I have a lot of great friends that are actual psychotherapists or you know counselors and stuff but make sure that they have a body of knowledge around narcissistic abuse and they know what it is because if not you'll it'll you know you'll end up worse than when you when you walked in the door so it, yeah. makes you, it makes you question yourself more. Yeah, like, am absolutely. I tripping? So I think that's what happens a lot just in any nar- like relationship with a narcissist. There's a lot of questioning yourself. Am I tripping? Am I wrong? Did I do, was I insensitive? Was I, did I hurt mm-hmm. this person? And like, I, that, I think it's also important, like Erica said, like not throwing them in the fire immediately with your friends, but recognizing if a, if a person you're dating is constantly trying to, um, avoid your friends Mm -hmm. and keep you to themselves like you said isolate Mm -hmm. then like that's an immediately a red flag because they're afraid that your friends are going to be smart enough to identify them and then tell you and then you're going to be smart enough to say i'm good so i I, like i I find a lot of women do that they think it's like romantic and cute and shit Mm -hmm. like oh you want to just be around me like it's us time and shit but like no bitch (laughs) <laughs> that's, that that was me I was that bitch I was literally at the beginning of the relationship I was like this man would keep me in the same room in a house for like hours
hours. And I thought because you know, obviously they use sex as like, you know, a tool and stuff like that. And I'm like, they do oh use sex God. as a tool, he right? He just wants to be, it's just me and him. And we stayed in the, like the house for like 24 hours and like in a room for like, you know, all this time. And my friend was looking at me like, what? <laughs> like, that sounds kind of crazy. You bitch, know? are you kidnapped? Yeah, <laughs> literally. And like my phone, he would take my phone and put it away. Like, we don't want phones. We don't want distractions. But this is during the grooming stage, the love bombing, right? right. And so mm. that is what kept me in the relationship, even when the red flags are, they were not even red flags at this point. They were just like full on like flares and shit. Like, you know, a whole <laughs> fireworks. Uh, like a house whole, was burning, bitch. A whole side. <laughs> yeah, the room. house was bor- burning and we're slow dancing together in there and I'm like I don't know what's happening but that's what happens in the relationship that that's the trauma bonding and the cognitive dissonance that happens you mentioned the you mentioned like the physical like the sex part I wonder if like most narcissists have bomb sex because they've learned to like manipulate like they've learned to manipulate through the physical and like well they always say like the best sex is with the the most toxic toxic person person. but so you can have a healthy relationship and have toxic toxic sex i want that god i want that right (laughs) so like please go on (laughs) (laughs) yeah but no most like most of them and i've heard like a little bit of both right it depends on what type of narcissist they are so to that point there's a type of narcissist called a somatic narcissist so somatic narcissist and I, I think that's kind of what my ex was too it's like you know you can that can be co- comorbid right so he was malignant but also somatic narcissist these guys or these people will be like in the gym they'll be like bodybuilders and like their physique like they lead with that that seduction of women and then they lead with sex so that's a there is a whole certain type of narcissist also it's called a somatic narcissist somatic narcissist yeah. so, leads so with the physical so, okay. they lead with the physicality they lead they with capture sex. you with their physicality yeah. and all the and like their and sex, the sex skills. is really intense but the thing is that like they they you think it's like intimacy when it's really intensity. So it'll be really intense. And once you know, you'll look back and it'll be like, no, that was more intense than it was like intimate. It's very so confusing. that's how they do that. But a lot of, yeah, a lot of survivors are like, okay, like the sex was great. Then there's a whole other type, like the covert narcissist that usually the sex is boring, mechanical. Like they don't even know how to perform in a way where it's just like blah, it's just all about them. They don't know how to please. And they also do this uh. thing that's called withholding. So after you get in a relationship with them, then they'll start to be like, I don't want to have sex with you. Like you're gross, blah, 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 whatever. And they'll make you to erode your self-esteem. Mm. So that's a whole type of narcissist also where they do that whole withholding and sex with them is just like a chore. Um, but they'll they'll still like do that to kind of like mess with your head. Or, or I feel like it's like like a treat, you know, like they mm-hmm. they give you this like amazing experience in the beginning, the love bombing, and then they remove it. And so you're always looking for that. And then they give you a little bit. So it feels mm-hmm. like a treat, like a like a mouse getting their snack. You're like, <laughs> you get it, like it's like a high, like you're going up and down. And so you're you're high on this love and then they pull it, the rug from beneath yep. your feet. And then you're searching for that validation again. You're searching for that intimacy and that yep. love and that intensity. And no, one day they just don't want to touch you. What the fuck are you talking yeah. about? We just had sex yesterday. <laughs> and then they... <laughs> right? Yeah, well, yeah. My ex used to do that too. Some of them like punish like, me like that too. Yeah, with sex, like pull it away and that kind of thing. Yeah, absolutely. And it's like, yeah. and then you're like, uh, yeah, punishing. Like, it's 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 strange, and you find yourself in this weird cycle, and you're like, how the fuck did I get here? Getting fucking like punished. I was dating someone, and <laughs> he was very like. Uh, there was a lot of ownership, a lot of jealousy. Yes. I feel like the narcissist that I've dated, there's a lot of jealousy and ego and ownership. And like, if you know me, you know, that doesn't really work that well for my personality type. Um, But like using words like you don't compromise and you're not obedient. Mm -hmm. And me thinking like, damn, like maybe like I I am too free and I'm not being obedient. And I'm maybe and love requires you to compromise and you're not compromising, Jamila. And so this is why I'm punishing you, basically. And it's just like this weird like you get caught up in this this addiction to the intimacy or whatever you feel like is intimacy at the time because it feels good, but only temporarily. And then like those those highs and those lows of the relationship is what you become addicted to. And it almost kind of feels fun. Because mm-hmm. you're chasing something, you know, but then yeah. at the end, it's just fucking emotionally dr- fucking draining mm-hmm. because you're like, do you fucking like me like you did yesterday? Or do <laughs> I have to t- literally I was just like coming in like, are we good right now? Where are we? Do you love me? Yeah. Do you love me? Do you hate me? 
<laughs> but I'm like, why do I have to test, stick my pinky in to see if the water is warm every other goddamn day? Are we supposed to go together? Yeah. Walking on eggshells, like that's what it is. It's a, that that di- that dynamic is on purpose. So there's a push pull dynamic, hot and cold, and that's what keeps you addicted. That's it's just a, it's it's addiction like science, right? Like a slot machine, right? If you can, you're gonna keep doing it if there's like a promise of like the bomb intimacy and what we had at the beginning. But that's just to keep you involved. It's called intermittent reinforcement. So intermittent. Inter- intermittent reinforcement, intermittent yeah, reinforcement. And that, a lot of narcissists do that and two like some women that i've also talked to also they're like i feel like this was the best sex i ever had but really it was just because they were depriving you of all other forms of intimacy so mm. you felt like that little breadcrumb that they were giving you <laughs> was like the best ever but it was just because you were being deprived i literally connection. told erica this two weeks ago <laughs> it's the best sex of my life <laughs> she did i was like okay oh, like, i'm never gonna get this sex ever again <laughs> she's like you, you will <laughs> i promise uh, yes if you're listening you will and then when you look back on it like once you get into a healthy you thought the other narcissist was the best sex of your life <laughs> it's, it's true it's true i mean think of it this is a trend my love look at her <laughs> and they're capturing my friend who is i mean me too but <laughs> you because you are such an empath like you're so loving and you're so giving and you're so forgiving i think that's the only thing that semi protected me like i've i've definitely dipped a big heavy toes in the narcissism pool but now i'd be jumping out like, I'd be like oh, oh yeah i gotta get out yeah. i'll be quick but i jump mm-hmm. in there real quick let me see what's happening over here nope but you are such uh, a lover and empath i just skinny dip dive right into the <laughs> fucking deep end and i'm like i'm drowning not for wait no i'm not no not okay i'm drowning again <laughs> erica come get me out <laughs> like, here i come <laughs> help I, I got you you're right i can't swim <laughs> Well, the one you're talking about really, really, really uh, um, reminded me of mine. And I told you that. Mm, you did. I was like, this sounds exactly like my nigga. <laughs> uh, he talks real smart. Mm. He be reading books and shit. Be saying quotes. He be thinking he's smart and shit. Mm-hmm. Be call- uh, honoring you. You'll be the most beautiful woman I've ever been with. This, this, that, that. And then you're a bitch. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. That's exactly just a switch. That's mm-hmm. how they, yeah. I didn't love you. You're a hoe. <laughs> <laughs> I would never do that. Right, right. I loved you last yeah. week. Not to, what? <laughs> <laughs> You're confused. I did say that. I didn't mean it. <laughs> <laughs> so crazy. And you know what? What which fucks? What always fucks me up is that I'm super, like, I do dip, dip too long into a lot of shit because I do love too hard. And I I'd be sticking around hoping for the best for people. But I just think that, I think it's more difficult when you are a self-aware woman, you are an intelligent woman, um, you are a strong woman, and then you find yourself in these relationships that don't reflect that. And then you feel embarrassed and ashamed. I I know I felt super ashamed, you know, in my, in a a lot of these relationships with my friends because I knew better. But, like, there was a time where I was so deep in it that I couldn't, I didn't want to talk I stopped wanting to talk about it. It would make me immediately emotional and immediately annoyed because I felt like I knew better, but I just couldn't get out Mm -hmm. yet. Like I was there and I knew I wasn't that happy. I saw what was happening, but I didn't have the strength to pick myself up and like do it yet. You know, like I was just like, just shut the fuck up. I know. Like Mm -hmm. just, I know, I know. And it was like hurtful that like my friends couldn't, relate because I just it was just a, it was I felt stuck I really felt stuck and um and I obviously have to deal with whatever it is that f- I'm bonded there that f- felt so familiar I mean and it's just someone I knew for a very long time I think that's another thing time you, you the deeper you get the deeper you know like you get woven into those relationships and I think you almost don't feel like you can end up in that space I'm too Mm -hmm. smart that would not happen to me and then you get like hit in your face in the middle of the night and you're bleeding you're like oh no this is actually like lifetime abuse (laughs) (laughs) like oh fuck I'm not that smart I think also like people are wait like wait for things to blow up to leave like okay Mm -hmm. well we're good we're good right now so let me just Mm -hmm. wait until it blows up into a Right, like a mm-hmm. fire of smoke and then I'll have a reason to leave. I need a real reason to leave. Like yeah. if I try to leave right here, he's going to fight me mm-hmm. and to confuse me to stay. It doesn't feel like this is a big enough deal. Right. All of these little things added up don't a thousand feel, cuts. A cut don't <laughs> feel big enough. Shoot me, nigga. <laughs> <laughs> oh my God. Shoot me and then I'll leave. <laughs> In the head. 
Oh my Not my God. foot or something. That's good. I could probably like make the sign. <laughs> I could get, wait, I don't, wait, 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 don't I worry, can, baby. I'll can, put that Jordan on. That. No one will know. <laughs> I'm that is me like I need a nigga to be like fuck you you stupid bitch and then I'm like <gasps> five times <laughs> damn it fine I'm out of here <laughs> disrespected me for the last 159th time to dirt <laughs> It's just like another I, uh, an important thing, though. Like when it comes to this trauma bonding, you're physically addicted to that person. Your body is biochemically addicted to it. It's like stress hormones mixed with oxytocin and all of that. And it's like when you leave, sometimes it feels like you're like detoxing from a drug. I it's l- easier to stay. I literally this last relationship that I did with this person that was for sure a narcissist. I saw it happen. We got the first time we got into the first argument. And he was, like, trying to send me away. He, we were out of town. He was like, did you buy that ticket back? It was, like, 2 o'clock in the morning. I was like, no. He's like, you need to buy that ticket back. And I was like, <gasps> it just seemed like, wow, this seems extreme. You're going to send me home because you're mad? And then he was like, I bought the ticket home. He went, gave me the money. I bought the ticket home at 2 o'clock in the morning. I was going to stay up to get on the first flight. He was like, you should stay. He's like, stay, actually. He's like, no. He's like, I think we love each other. What the that fuck? push and pull. That's what it that's is. That's what he said. He told me to leave. He told me to book. I booked a ticket, and then he said, "I think we love each other." Mm-hmm. And it was like, I was like, "We do." Yeah. That's and then he fucked addicted. me, and I stayed. And in my mind, I said, "This is about to be some sick shit," and I like it. <laughs> in my mind, I I felt all these ways. Like I was like cognitive enough to to see it happen. I saw how he was working, and I was I saw that I liked it. And I was like, something's wrong with you, bitch. I was like, the fact that you felt like discarded and then you felt picked back up and you felt love in that pick back up is where this shit's about to get crazy. And the, for the next six months, <laughs> I stayed in that situation. It was just like that. It was like up and down, up and down. But like now that I finally got shot in the head. <laughs> <laughs> I lived to tell the story. I lived to tell the story. <laughs> I knew better, you know, and I think as like smart women, it's hard, you know, like, well, I tell all my business, so well, here we are. But I, I think it's important that we have these conversations because you're not alone, bitch. Like it, it, it's deeper than just being a smart woman and like being able to recognize it. Like you really have to cut the cord and walk away and then continue to practice walking away because I did walk away one time for one month and then I went back and then I'm now I'm here again. I mean, I'm gone now, but you know what I mean? So it's just like there is this real really this attachment to that feeling that you have to really heal from. And like, I'm, I, f- I feel crazy that I'm 33 years old. I'm somebody's parent. I've done this multiple times and I still get caught up. You know, I can still get like, I, I, it's scary to me that I can fall into that pattern so easily because I know how like a week can turn into s- six months and six months can turn into a year and a year can turn into three and you wake up and you're like, bitch, you knew from the beginning and you ignored it but it's like really it's it is about healing yourself and and working on yourself and able to be able to be like erica and dip in and dip the fuck out when you see the signs immediately well what how do you like what if if it is and it is so like within your body and you become addicted in this way Mm -hmm. like oxytocin how do you as a like how do you even begin because i've told you me i'm like block this nigga mm-hmm. she was like i blocked him and then i know like four days later she's unblocked to see or she opens up her <laughs> computer and her computer did not block him and so now she sees the text and it's like how do you why do you know my life like this? <laughs> how because i that's happened to me when i block someone and i opened my computer and i was like fuck he, like god no he did curse me out shit <laughs> um how do you even like what is the beginning of someone who has been like very traumatized by a narcissist? Like mm-hmm. besides, yes, you got to cut them off. Right. But like, yeah. how, how do you, you keep them cut off? How do you like retrain your body and your reaction? Yeah. Like what are like some things that you can do? I know, obviously I know that you have to be consistent. I know mm-hmm. that like you have to be uncomfortable, being uncomfortable, you know, mm-hmm. which is really hard, you know, but is there anything else? Like, yeah, well, a lot of times, you know, women or people, when they feel like, you know, they can get sucked back in, they haven't processed the emotion and the pain that 
happened in the relationship, right? Even though it was really abusive. So what happens is you get sucked back into something called repetition compulsion. You think that you're getting closure by going back to that person. If I can go back to them, then they can heal the same wound that they made. When you really think about it, it doesn't make any sense. But subconsciously, and unfortunately, your subconscious brain runs like 95% of what you do. Subconsciously, you're going to get sucked back in. So it's a process of, of course, blocking them, but literally like really blocking them on every possible thing. Like don't pain shop. Like don't look at their social media. It's pain shopping. Don't look back at videos and pictures and pain stuff like shop. that. Pain, pain shop. Pain shop. Like, yeah. like look at the pictures and like fantasize. Like, yeah. oh, like, like, yeah. like age your, like your sadness. Yeah, exactly. That, and that's what, that's what gets people like roped back in. They just like start like reminiscing. About the good, the good what you thought the were the good bombing. times. Right. Yeah. And the love bombing is what you're is the oxytocin is what you're addicted to yeah 100 percent. yeah you know what i did this time i sent th- screenshots of the text message to at least five friends of him like blatantly disrespecting me so if in the future i act crazy bitch will be like Show i have this. to look at it i have to know like not only did this nigga talk to me crazy i told all my friends and that's what i'll i'd love bomb i mean how do you call it what did you do love love bombing no when you look at the pictures oh pain, pain shop i pain shop the mean shit I mm-hmm. like look at this text like no bitch no nope, that's not an option yeah that's the only picture you should keep <laughs> you put right. that on your phone screensaver yeah like no. <laughs> oh god yeah, <laughs> yeah. and I know that's actually that's one of the you know one of the exercises very at the beginning but like journaling about it get really clear because once you put stuff down on paper it creates cognitive distance in between you and the thought so you can really look at this is what this person did to me you know write it in detail and then on the other side you can write what you actually want like out of, out of a partner, like what a relationship really looks like to you, your ideal mate and all of that to get really clear. So there's not all this like mental chatter of like what actually happened and you don't feel drawn to that person for closure that they're never going to give you. Cause it's just a, as long as you keep coming back to a narcissist, they will take you back in for narcissistic supply. They love X recycling. That's what they do. They're like, Oh, you came back to me. Yeah. Yeah, you love me. Right. Let me throw you away again. Yeah, hundred percent. So as long as you keep yourself in that cycle, you will. But really when it comes to like your body and how you heal, like, breath work meditation all of these things dance movement regulate your nervous system and then you're really clear your brain your body your body really determines more than your mindset does so your body sends more there's more connections that go from your body to your brain than your brain to your body Mm. so if you regulate yourself with embodiment practices and safety practices then you'll start to think more clear that makes sense yeah you were just saying how you wanted to take dance class I did, yeah. I am going to. I'm going. I'm taking a salsa, ball, ballroom salsa. Uh, we actually just did. I just did a master class on this Thursday um, with a girl named Emma, and it was like safety embodiment, and she did the whole movement as medicine part of it, and mm. I taught all the you know recovering your body and nervous system regulation and stress management and all of that, and that is really the process of healing. If you don't heal your body, you don't change your beliefs and all of that, and you'll get sucked right back into it. So. Even if you know better. Yeah, even if you know better. Yeah, it's not about, and a lot of people say that they're like, the like, same thing you said. Like, for me, like, people around me were like, oh, my God, like, they're smart and confident and all of this stuff. But narcissists target smart, beautiful, attractive people that are, like, secure because it's more of a It's more like fun to dim. It's more yeah. fun to dim their they light. They want to tear you down, and they want it because it's all about ownership and, like, being controlling and stuff like that. If they can get a free spirit and, like, get you under their thumb or you're you. subservient – that's more that they like that. That's what they will do. So it has nothing to do with like whether you're like smart you or not. Smart. Yeah. yeah. Like the smartest, like smartest people in the world can like, they're, they're con artists. So like a cult. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Oh my God. They're sick. Yeah. <sighs> <sighs> Let's throw them out. I've decided. Put them on an island. I don't, don't want to. An island, it would be better with no boats. Yeah. <laughs> Give them some seeds they can farm or something. <laughs> We're going to leave you here with these seeds and bye. <laughs> Good luck. <laughs> oh, God. Wow. Well, this has been so informative. Thank you so much. I feel like I've gotten some clarity on, you know, definitely the ways, the things that I've overlooked and the things that I should look for. And I hope you guys have. I think this is such an important conversation. I think that so many people are in relationships right now with narcissists and maybe they didn't even realize it until hearing this episode. So, so get the fuck out. Yes. Don't wait for the explosion. Don't look back. There's already been explosions. I promise you there has, you know, there have, Mm -hmm. there have been, um, don't wait for the next big one. But also I know that it's, it's easier said than done. It is. It's really easier said than done. I mean, was that right? Easier said than yeah, done. Yeah, easier said. Yeah. Well, I was like, wait, mm-hmm. what? Yeah. Um, 
can you let our listeners know where to find you and like what I mean obviously like you sign up like people with <laughs> people in those relationships call her immediately yes yes <laughs> get yes. help yes I'm here and that because that's important you have to have people that understand it don't so don't like spin yourself in like circles talking to people that don't get it they never been through it. It's just going to make it worse. So find somebody that gets it. Um, you guys can find me on Instagram at lovebombedmd. Um, you can email me if you have any questions. Um, and yeah, I'll, I'm actually launching a four-week course coming up in the next two weeks. And it's going to be about literally like right when you leave, what you might experience, how to heal your body, your nervous system, dealing with the smear campaign, not getting hoovered back in, empowerment, like taking your power back and all of that. So, and I'll be introducing that. I might need to take that so. class. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's a four-week bitch. live course and we're going in. Like, we're Oh, really, it's a live course. Yeah, it's going to be four weeks of, yeah, so. Right, I need to, I need to count, I need to be accountable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. Amazing. Well, you guys know where to find us. Good Moms, Bad Choices on all platforms. Make sure you join our Patreon. We have some cool content over there. Um, that's patreon.com backslash Good Moms, Bad Choices. Join our Slack community. We have a community of women that are connecting every single day. We're talking, we're sharing, we're talking about our narcissistic baby daddies, boyfriends, family members. How we're <laughs> recovering from them. <laughs> and sending nudes. <laughs> Um, if you guys haven't uh, signed up for our retreat in Costa Rica, make sure that you do. There may or may not be some slots left right now. But go to goodmomsbadchoices.com backslash retreats and you will find out. There will probably be more, but if you want to be on the list for those, hit us up. And if you have any horries, please submit your horries. Only high level, great horries at this point. Don't come with that weak shit. <laughs> oh wait, should we do a hori real quick? Should I share this hori? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> we have a, we have an, um, a a segment on our show called Horror Stories where people write in um, their hotels. I love it. And uh, love this one was good. Stories. We just got this yesterday, and it goes a little something like this. Some years ago, I was 35 years old and just broken up after a nine-year relationship of really bad and unsatisfying sex. A few months later, I traveled to New York with a couple of girlfriends. Oh, by the way, I'm European. After my arrival to Brooklyn, I thought this is the perfect place for dating. Tinder was hyped at the time, so I downloaded Tinder and started swiping. There was, <clears throat> there was this one handsome guy who was a bit more, t who had a bit more time to text. As he was on sick leave, he had broken his leg. This suited me perfectly. I, I don't know how I missed this part when I read this. This suited me perfectly as I quickly learned that Tinder and NYC is really quick. So this guy gave me more space for texting as I was in a situation of be being newly single. We agreed to meet after a few days. I thought that this was, a, was safe as this guy had walking sticks. LOL. <laughs> the date night came and I agreed to meet him at the bar just a block away and at a place in the East Village. We had cocktails and talked. He was smooth as fuck. I still remember how he placed his hand on my on my thigh, and I thought, wow, this is exciting. Remember I, <clears throat> remember, I had been in misery for the last nine years. We had one more drink, and then we ended up going to his place where he made us drinks. His place was unique, full of sneakers. He was a collector. I decided not to drink the drink as it tasted strong, and I didn't see him make it, so I couldn't tell if he put something in it. We ended up kissing and taking off clothes. And when he took his underpants off, I was thinking, what the fuck is that? It's huge. I'm sure he saw how huge my eyes went. Little by little, he managed to get his huge penis inside of me and started to fuck me. And I mean, he fucked me hard. <laughs> Just to point out here that I was in a relationship for nine years when my partner... Uh, where my partner always came in a few minutes and his penis was small. So now that I was <laughs> now that I was there with this handsome six five tall six five six five foot Dominican New Yorker, I felt like I was being reborn. I remembered what great sex with a good sized hard dick feels like. How I love to be fucked for hours, like it was a workout. It was fantastic. After the first act, he asked, "So how was it? Better or worse than your ex?" I said, "Better." <clears throat> Uh, better than that, I never got better than what I ever got in the last nine years. He said, I'm sorry. And I laughed. After a small break, we continued, we continued and slept a bit. And then what happened was after that was that I started to bleed. It was not my period since I had just had that two weeks before. We thought that he had somehow broken me. <laughs> he was trying to look inside my pussy and said that he might have torn me up. 
I would. I really wish I could have seen this visual of him looking inside of her. Wow. Well, like, everything looks good. Are, yeah. are you okay? Did I break you? Well, that's where the fun <laughs> ended, and he was embarrassed. We ended up cleaning his sheets and mattress with baby wipes, um, which he said he had for his sneakers. He had he had never <laughs> he had to get going to work, so we showered quickly, and I was bleeding and stuffing my pants with toilet paper. He drove me to the closest subway stop, then I went to see my friends and told them the story. I flew back home after two days, a few days, and I was still bleeding, so I had to go see the doctor. They said that my pussy will heal itself, but of course, they also had to ask if I was raped or if there was any <laughs> violence involved. I was just trying to explain that his penis was just really big. The learning of all this was great. I remembered how much I love sex, how I love to be fucked. I will never ever again settle into a relationship with bad sex as I had previously because as I had previously had because in my mind I was thinking I don't want to be superficial. Um so superficial that I would leave someone for bad sex. Girl. My sexuality had been sleeping for 9 years and now I found it again. Thank you NYC. That was it. That was beautiful. <laughs> NYC will do it. You know, New York does. It just, it, it just, it just opens you up <laughs> in the <laughs> right way. Up in so many ways. Um, okay, well, that was the Hori, and uh, catch you guys later. <laughs> Bye.